So chapter 11 is all about making inferences for categorical data, in particular the distributions of categorical data. So we're going to go beyond z-tests and t-tests, and we're going to talk about chi-square tests. So we have this Greek letter chi, looks like a fancy x, and then the square. So the first part here says, what is a one-way table? And we can think about uh, sort of our M&Ms data. A one-way table just takes um, categorical data and organizes it or displays it. It has one less row than a two-way table. So what is a chi-square test for goodness of fit? We're going to abbreviate here chi-square, and it's G-O-F, for goodness of fit. We can say that compares an observed distribution, so one that we observe in reality, to a hypothesized distribution, one that somebody claims is true. So that's what a chi-square goodness of fit test does. It compares an observed distribution to a hypothesized distribution, and it most certainly is not about any specific parameters. That was uh, last chapter for z-tests and t-tests. This is about an entire distribution of categorical data. Okay, so if it's a test, what are the null and alternative hypotheses like for a chi-square goodness of fit test? So the null is going to say something like the population of blank M&Ms, for example, is distributed as blank, whatever the claim is. Maybe 13% red, 15% brown, so on and so forth. So pretty basic, it just says the population of whatever uh, the population is, right? maybe it's M&Ms, is distributed as such. And then the alternative just says, yeah, no it's not. Right? The population of whatever is not distributed that way. So really the alternative just negates that statement from the null hypothesis. So this is equivalent to just being a not equal to, right? So the alternative doesn't say greater than or less than. It just says, you know that distribution from the null? Yeah, we don't believe it. It's not distributed that way. So you can think of that as being a not equal to test or uh, from last chapter, that's like a two-sided test. So how do you calculate the expected counts? Right? We have to calculate these expected counts for a chi-square goodness of fit test. And should we round it to the nearest integer? So for the expected counts, you always use the null hypothesis. Right? We start out by assuming that that null hypothesis is true. So we're going to create our expected counts based on what the null distribution says. Okay, so after we create those counts, should we round those off to the nearest integer? And no, don't do that. So don't round the expected counts. So you can keep at least one, maybe two decimal places. That's a common mistake among AP Stat students. They think they need to round it to the nearest integer. Don't. And the reason we don't round those expected counts, they actually represent an average, right? So we can say because they represent the average number in each category if we did repeated samples. So just remember, don't round those expected counts as the nearest integer. Keep at least one or two decimal places. Okay, the next part asks, what is the chi-square test statistic? We used to calculate z-scores and t-scores. This is similar in a way. So chi-square, I'm going to leave a little space here. This equals, we take the observed count minus whatever the expected count is, and we square that difference. So how far is the observed from the expected? Maybe it's negative, maybe it's positive, but after we square it, it'll be positive. And then divide that by whatever the expectation was. And we do that for each value in our one-way table. And then we add them all up. Is this on the formula sheet? My answer typically is no, but this one actually is. So the chi-square test statistic, this formula is actually on the formula sheet. And what can we say it measures exactly? So this formula, 
measures how much different the observed distribution is from the hypothesized distribution. So we go through each cell for each one. How far was our observed count from our expected count? Then we square that value and divide by whatever the expected count was. We do that for each one, and then we add them all up, and that's our chi-square test statistic. Okay, the next part asks, in the goodness of fit test, when does the chi-square test statistic actually follow a chi-square distribution? How do you calculate the degrees of freedom for a chi-square goodness of fit test? Okay, so we do have a chi-square condition, kind of like how we used to have a normality condition. In this case, we want to see that the expected counts are all at least 5. All the expected counts are greater than or equal to 5. That's our chi-square condition. So as long as this condition is met, our shape will follow that chi-square shape. And then how do we calculate the degrees of freedom? So we're familiar with the notation df. In this case, we just take the number of categories and subtract 1. Not so bad. Pretty simple, actually. Number of categories minus 1. So that's a little bit different as far as calculating degrees of freedom goes. So just a note here to keep things straight from what we've seen before. Degrees of freedom doesn't depend on sample size. Okay? In this case, for chi-square, it just depends on the number of categories. So I've got this diagram down here. It says, describe the shape, center, and spread of chi-square distributions. How are these based on the degrees of freedom? So you can see the first graph has degrees of freedom equal to 1. The next graph has 4 degrees of freedom. And then this graph has 8 degrees of freedom. So let's talk about the shape, center, and spread for these chi-square distributions. First of all, the shape. We're really used to normal curves. These definitely aren't normal, right? Normal would be nice and symmetric, bell-shaped. That's not these guys. These guys are all clearly skewed to the right. Especially this one with one degree of freedom. Right? That's just one big slope. Definitely skewed to the right. And the center, and we'll still talk about means here. Remember, mean would be like a balance point for these graphs. So I'm going to use this blue color. For means, if I could balance this one, it would actually be here at 8, this value. This one would be here at 4, the balance point. This guy's actually at 1. So my point being, the mean for these graphs is whatever the degrees of freedom are. So that's worth noting for a chi-square distribution. The mean will be at the value for the degrees of freedom. And then if you look at enough of these graphs, you'll start to notice a pattern for where the peaks are at, right? The highest point. Where is the peak at for these graphs? And we can show both of those here. Um, the peak, if I make a dotted line here in red, that's actually just two less than whatever the degrees of freedom are. Now, notice I didn't draw into the third one because it's just a slope. It doesn't even have a peak here. Lastly, the spread, we typically measure that in standard deviations. There is a formula for the standard deviation of these graphs. It's the square root of 2 times the degrees of freedom. That would be the standard deviation for a chi-square distribution. So when you're using these distributions, how do you calculate p-values? And this should be a capital P, by the way. Let me fix my notation here. Capital P for p-values. Because we usually, if you remember from last chapter, we'll mark off a certain area, a critical value, a test statistic, and we'll shade everything above it. And our p-value will be whatever's in the tail. So how do we do that? Well, we have a table of values. We use those in the, in the M&M's activity. All right, so we could either use the table or, my personal favorite, let's just use our calculator command, the chi-squared CDF. And when you do that, on the AP exam, say, you just have to note the lower bound that you use, the upper bound, and the degrees of freedom. And you do have to uh, show those labels. And just like normal CDF or TCDF, that's under second and VARS. 
So that's where all the distribution commands are. Okay, so let's talk about the first example. It says, a fair die, or isn't, hence the question mark. Liz made a six-sided die in her ceramics class and rolled it 60 times to test if each side was equally likely to show up on top. Or was her die kind of a piece of junk and one side showed up more often or less often than the other sides? We'll just see how good Liz is with ceramics. Okay, so let's state these hypotheses that Liz is interested in testing. The null and the alternative. So the null would say... Everything's the same. Everything's all good. Everything's fair throughout. So in context, the null hypothesis would say each side of the die is equally likely. In other words, it's a fair die. The alternative just negates that statement here. The alternative says each side is not equally likely. In other words, it's an unfair die. Part B, assuming that her die is fair, calculate the expected counts for each possible outcome. And it's important to note that she actually rolled it 60 times, right? That's kind of actually a nice number here. And the other important thing is that we are going to start out by assuming that the die is actually fair, right? So if the die is actually fair and we roll it 60 times and there's only six sides, the expected counts would be the same for each outcome, right? Because there's six sides, so for any given side to show up, it would be that one side out of six times the 60 rolls. So we would expect each side to show up 10 times. So whether it's a one, a two, roll a three, any of the sides, if it's fair, we'd expect each one to come up 10 times and that would give us our 60 rolls. So part C actually shows the results here in the table. So she got a 1 13 times, a 2 11 times. She only got a 3 6 times. So she's definitely off 10 for most of these. Uh, and the question now is, is that due to just some chance variation, which we might expect a little bit, or is that just too uncommon that we can trust that her die is really fair? So to do that, we've got to start by getting our chi-square statistic. Let's compare our observed counts with our expected counts. So let's add the expected counts here next to the table. In each one of them, we would expect 10. Or we would expect 10 from each of these guys. And then let's go down and compare for each outcome, 1 through 6, how far was our observed count from our expected count. So for our chi-square test statistic, make the chi-square. That equals, let's start with the first one. We observed 13 ones, and we expected 10. So 13 minus 10. And I'm just following that formula we talked about for chi-square. The observed count minus the expected, 13 minus 10. Square that, and then divide by the expected count, which is 10. And then that one's done, and then we move to the next one, which is 11 observed. So we start with 11, and we would have expected 10, so we'll do minus 10. Square that difference, and divide by the expected count, which is 10. Okay, so hopefully we've done two. You're starting to catch on, right? So it actually suffices here, even for the AP exam. You've illustrated the pattern. You can get a little lazy. Put dot, 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 and let's skip all the way to the last one. So plus, uh, skip a few, dot, 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 and then plus, the very last one is 8. Minus 10 for the expected. Square it. Divide by 10. So this whole dot, dot, dot thing is actually kind of nice. And we only had six to do, and we could still skip half of them, right? You illustrate the first couple terms in the pattern, and then put plus, dot, 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 plus, and show the last one, and that's good. 
That is totally acceptable. Okay, uh, and if we sum all those up, we get 3.4 for our chi-squared value. Our chi-squared test statistic is 3.4. So that's what we're going to use to find the p-value. Similar to how we used z-scores before. In finding the p-value, what's the probability we would get a chi-square of 3.4 or bigger? Okay, so I'm going to do my best to make a nice chi-square curve here. Okay, and then I'm going to mark off 3.4 for my chi-square test statistic. So I'm going to mark that with a dotted line here. And I'm going to shade everything above that. So I'm going to shade the tail above it. Notice I've actually shaded a bunch of the curve here. And so that green shaded area represents our p-value. It looks like over half the curve, which in fact it is. So to calculate that, we can either look at the table or I'm going to use the chi-square CDF command in the calculator. So it's going to ask me for the lower bound, the upper bound, and the degrees of freedom. And I do have to label those for AP grading. The lower bound would be, well, I marked it off right here, right? The lower bound that I shaded was 3.14, not 3.14, excuse me, just 3.4. I just can't get pi out of my brain. Sorry about that. The upper bound, well, technically that just keeps going, so we would use 1E99 for our upper bound. Degrees of freedom would be, well, there's six categories for the outcomes here, so categories minus one would be five. So doing chi-squared CDF in our calculator with those inputs gives a p-value of 0.639. So what's the probability I have a chi-square greater than or equal to 3.4, especially when I have degrees of freedom of 5, and I get this graph? We just found it to be 0.639. So the final part here, part E, says make an appropriate conclusion, and we have to use this p-value. So that's a huge p-value meaning we would absolutely fail to reject the null hypothesis. We didn't even define an alpha level, but that's way bigger than any alpha level we would ever use. So we can say because our p-value of 0.639 is larger than any reasonable alpha level, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And we also have to give a statement that says what this means in context. So if we fail to reject the null, that means we do not have convincing evidence of the alternative. In other words, we do not have convincing evidence that the die is actually unfair. So way to go, Liz. You're a ceramics pro. All right, that concludes our introduction to chi-square goodness of fit tests. We talked about the shapes of these things. They're definitely right skewed. We talked about how to get the degrees of freedom. We also talked about the formula, which is on the formula sheet, for the chi-squared test statistic. So that is all for these notes. I'll see you in class.